Thank you very much, Brother Chairman. Here we are again. There's a few more faces in the audience uh, today, so that's it's very nice. And I hope that uh, you can see the, the wonder, wonderful love and, and power in, in this subject, um, brothers and sisters. So you might remember yesterday, uh, for those that weren't here, just a, a quick uh, recap. We looked at how forgiveness works. We looked at the, the, the conditions that uh, are a part of this process, God's righteous requirements. And they are those three steps, the confession of sin. We then looked at repentance, that is to have a change of heart, and then conversion, to turn away and walk in the opposite direction. So it really is a 180 degree turn. It's, it's an, an acknowledgement that we need to put something else in our lives uh, apart from our previous lifestyle or our previous behaviours. And of course God ordained this process. And because it's a divine process, it also has some very, very deep psychological reasoning behind it, which we probably to a large extent don't understand. But God in his wisdom has asked us to go through that process that we might learn within that process to turn from sin, not just to, to, to repeat the offence over and over again, even though God will forgive, he of course wants us to turn from sin in the end. So the need of forgiveness and how all this works in the lives of a few uh, biblical characters which we're, we're going to look at this session. Now, you might remember, also from our last class, it's really, really important for us to know what it is that disconnects us from God. Well, let me tell you what it's not. It's not our nature. It's, God is at pains in the Bible to stress to us that it's not our mortality he has a problem with, even though it is a problem. It, that's not what the problem is. It's the sin that he's aggrieved with that our nature produces if you like. It's, it's, it's not the state we've born into. So Isaiah 59 and verse 1 says this. It says, Behold, Yahweh's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sin, your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Of course, as we mentioned before, don't, don't be fooled about this. Of course our nature is a problem. It's a big problem. But the, So the carnal mind or the nature that we're, we're born with it is terrible biases and tendencies or disabilities, if you like. So in a very real sense, we are all born with this disability. We mentioned David last night, that he said he has a loathsome disease in his, in his loins and that he's passing on to his children. He couldn't, couldn't do anything about it. So, of course, this is all going to change, says Paul's our, our, our chairman mentioned in his prayer. In, in the twinkling of an eye, our nature will be changed. God's real problem, problem is when we what the Bible calls, allow sin to reign in our members. Reign like a despot, a ruler, a king. That's what God's problem is. And we become, we come under the bondage of habitual sin, lawlessness. And we all sin, we all sin repeatedly. The problem is, is when we give in to our nature. We give in, we stop trying to replace that inherent bias that we have with God's remedy that we find ourselves in an unforgivable state. So lawlessness and habitual sin, God really wants us to work hard at overcoming those things and turn away from those things. That doesn't mean, of course, that we're going to stop sinning. Of course we will. But lawlessness implies that we don't really care and that we've completely given in. We will never overcome, brothers and sisters, with sheer willpower. But the golden key is to replace. Replace the natural with the spiritual. So it's going to be a combination of prayer and the word. In other words, a relationship with God. That's what this is about. It's what our nature produces that God finds abhorrent and repulsive. In fact, so much so that he cannot look upon sin himself. 
The question is, do we see sin in that same light? Uh, the answer, if we're honest, we're going to say no, we don't, because it's a part of our thinking processes. But what the Bible does is highlight to us our inherent biases, and then we can start to see it, which is exactly the purpose of the law, to highlight sin for what it really is. So in a natural fact, it's an act of mercy on God's part to highlight this to us, because he's trying to save us from our own selves. Just have a think about for a minute some of the, some of the wonderful products, if you like, of our nature. You know, we're, you don't have to turn the, the news on very much to hear, hear these things. Murder. You know, obviously springs out, it could be envious. And you might say to yourself, well, that's, that's uh, I've never, never murdered anybody. Well, actually, that's not, not how John sees it. John says, if you hate your brother, God considers that as murder. Can God forgive that? Of course he can. Envious. We become envious, we're covetous. What about adultery? That's a big problem in the world in which we live, unfaithfulness. And I don't necessarily mean a literal adultery, adultery of the mind. Just ask the question for yourself, brethren and sisters, particularly brethren, because I'm a man, I understand the wretchedness of, of a male brain, so to speak. And you think about this. When one was brought in, taken with adultery to Jesus Christ, and he said to them, he that is without sin cast the first stone and they went out from the oldest to the youngest so the oldest man said well I can't, certainly can't throw a stone as far as this is concerned but the Bible is very very succinct in what it says, t tells us next it says and there was no man left in the midst that's honesty. No man left there. Such is the nature that we have. Fornication, anger, jealousy, backbiters, haters of God. And if a man says, I love God, but hates his brother, says John, he's a liar. So we're guilty of all these things. Spiteful, proud, etc., etc. We we, we're not here to talk about a list of how bad we are. We, we already know so then, how great is our need for forgiveness? What about Jesus Christ? Did he, what did he do about this? Well, effectively, he never allowed himself to be in that bondage. That's what he never allowed King Sin to give him one whiplash, mentally speaking, spiritually speaking. Never did. Thus, it is written. Do you remember the occasion was Jesus out? With, was, he was out with his disciples one day and. They come across a man who had a problem from birth. So he's born with this issue. He was blind. Here's how it reads. In fact, let me put it up on the screen there. It reads like this. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his, from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see the understanding? that the disciples had, very, very deeply ingrained in, in that particular culture at that time. So the question is this, is this man disabled from birth because his parents did something wrong, and this is God's answer to them, or is this man disabled from birth because God knew he was going to do something wrong so he was disabled from birth? And the answer to the both of those things is, neither hath this man sinned or his parents. He doesn't mean that they've never sinned. He says there was no particular thing. This issue was not brought upon him because of sin. But that the works of God, this is the answer, should be made manifest in him. That is exactly the same for you and I. Remember we said that this is all about God manifestation, God working within us, creating within us a good work, and our eyes are opened. So this is what um, 
a brother John Thomas said about our nature. He said, human nature, or sinful flesh, has three principal channels through which it displays its waywardness against the law of God. These are expressed by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All that is in the world stands related to these points of our nature. There is no temptation that can be devised but what assails it in one or more of these three particulars, meaning everything we do will fall into one of those three categories. This sinful nature we inherit, it is our misfortune, not our crime, that we possess it. We're only blameworthy when being supplied with the power of subduing it, we permit it to reign over us. This power, this power resides in the testimony of God so that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Our job, brothers and sisters, is not to fix ourselves, is to suppress. And the only thing in the world that will suppress it, honestly and truthfully, is not you, not your willpower, it's this book. That's the answer. So through no fault of our own are we born with this affliction. It's neither our crime or our parents. But we are all in this state whether we like it or we, or we don't like it. So, so here's, our, here's our nature, the carnal mind. Our nature is basically untamable. Untamable. You can't work with it. It's probably true to say a dog is more trainable than our basic core nature. We cannot make it good. We can't clean it ourselves. It's born selfish. It dies selfish. It can only be subdued or restrained by God's word. But it still, even then, remains very, very selfish. Even then. And that's why Paul says about himself, he says, I am a wretch. I'm a thorough wretch because everything I want to do right, I don't seem to do, and everything I, I, I don't want to do, I seem to do. That's Paul the Apostle. Seeing himself for what he really was. So Paul the Apostle puts it this way, in terms of the carnal mind, he says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What a contrast that is. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It will never be subject to the law of God. As I said before, our job is suppression. That's what the work of God is. And to, and to see that you have biases in certain areas, and not to put yourself in a bad position where your nature is incredibly strong and will just fling out at any given moment. So then, they that, that are in the flesh cannot please God. They're serving themselves, in other words. But you are not in the flesh. He says to us, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In the words of John, are we abiding in Christ? So the spirit of Christ then, brothers and sisters, is the only way forward. It's the only way forward as far as our eternal well-being is concerned. It really is. So humanism, postmodernism, milk of human kindness, human rights, whatever they are, they stand totally unrelated to the spirit of Christ. So now that we know that sin separates us from God, let, let's just do a bit of math. This is, this is probably worth looking at, and I'll, I'll use myself as an example here. So how many sins? So Peter asks a question. I think it's a, it's a valid question. How many times should I forgive my brother? And he, he sort of volunteer, volunteers this number seven times. That's a, a good, nice, round, complete number. Seven times. What do you think of that? And Christ responded, Peter, no, 70 times 7. So, 490 times. 
Is Christ actually saying that God's threshold, the ceiling for where he forgives, is 490 uh, times? So let me, let, let's put it this way. Now, I've been baptised for 35 years. I was baptised on the 1st of July, 1987. So 35 yesterday, there we are. Now, let's say, for example, for my small mind, in terms of math mathematics, I know there's some, a lot of very intelligent people out there. So let's just say I have sinned 10 times per day. All right? So 70 times a week. That's 280 times a month. So within two months of me being baptised, I've used up the 490. Wow. That didn't take long. That's only on 10 times a day. I suggest to you it's way more. That's 3,650 times a year. And to date... 127,000 sins. The 490 has long gone. I think, brothers and sisters, that to a certain extent your life is similar to mine. I think we are sinning. And when I say sin, I mean falling short of God's glory. Not only every month or every week, every day, every hour, and possibly, possibly, minute by minute, at least every hour, we are actually fall, falling short of God's glory all the time. And you might say, really? Every hour? Brothers and sisters, I'm not just talking about sins of commission, things that we commit. What about sins of omission? The things that we have omitted to do, which we should have done for God. That, to me, is a whole other mountain of sins. If I really wanted to, I could probably start to count the stuff I do wrong. If I was that cra crazy, I'd go crazy straight away. But then I've got this mound of omission. Can you see how we're constantly falling short of God's glory all the time? One sin separates us from God. Just one. So what was the 490 about then? Did Christ just sort of pluck that out? of the air and say, no, nah, no, nah, it should be a much bigger number, 490. He actually had a very, very good reason for quoting that number. Is there a point then? He says, but it's, the question, obviously, of Peter's mind, is there a point where enough is enough? And God says, no, nah, I'm done with it. Everybody gets 490 and that's it. I think Jesus Christ is telling Peter, don't count, Peter. Don't count at all. Because God doesn't count. God doesn't think like a man. My ways are not your ways. They are higher, much higher than your ways. I think the 490, though, brothers and sisters, is almost another subject, but suffice it to say this, I think it comes straight from Daniel. Let me, let me just remind you of this. Daniel's 70-week prophecy in Daniel 9 says this. So Daniel's, Daniel's been praying to his God. He's asking for forgiveness because we have done wickedly and he's on his knees and he's pleading with God on behalf of the nation and an angel comes to him and says this 70 weeks Daniel now that 70 most commentators should read like this 70 weeks of years should be 70 times 7 is the correct rendering 70 times 7 490 years so this is how, Daniel 9 verse 24. 490 years are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. Now listen to this. What's happening at the end of the 490? To finish transgression? To make an end of, end of sins? To make reconciliation for iniquity? Oh, this is definitely sounding like Christ's existence. And to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. And lo and behold, you had the 490 from where Daniel was at the time under Artaxerxes or Darius the king and it comes to the month Nisan, AD 70, 33 where they say was the very month where Jesus Christ was crucified. And he made reconciliation for iniquity at that time to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Because you see, Peter, after 490 years, 
there's going to be forgiveness without end. And then there will be no counting sin. So Peter suggests seven times. And in verse 23 of, of, of Matthew 18, Christ explains the real situation to him via parable. It's a parable which is full of Daniel 9, actually, the more you look into it. And the parable is all about how God forgave national Israel, but tragically what happened was when they were released from Babylon, they went back to their land and they threw prophet after prophet into prison. And in the end, after all throwing these prophets into dungeons and sewers and all sorts of rotten places, ending up with John the Baptist and look where they took his life from his throat. They grabbed him by the throat and said, pay that you owe. And I think that is exactly what Christ is referring to in the 490. Now verse 24 says, one was brought unto him. Now, this brother had been caught squandering an awesome amount of money. Money which was not his to spend. And he's been stealing this money and, and living up for a long, long time. And now the sort of money we're talking about in today's value, there's a few numbers sort of bandied around, but one common one was about $10 million. Now, th th they say for this man, what he had spent was about 200 years wages. And I think that's the point. The point is, we only get one lifetime. This man had ridden up enough debt for two lifetimes. Get the point? He can't do it. It's an impossible thing to pay back. And foolishly, in a moment, he's going to ask, give me time. What, another lifetime to pay back? In fact, he needs two other lifetimes on top of the one he's just wasted. Impossible. You know, we have, the, we have trouble understanding, don't we, the magnitude of sin. I think that's the point of the parable. We need to understand the magnitude of our own personal sin, our need for forgiveness. And one of the reasons for that, as we alluded to yesterday, actually, we live in a world that is largely desensitised to sin. And to a greater or lesser degree, we're all affected by that. And we, we think it's normal to sin. This is sort of normal, normal behaviour. This is how we rationalise it. We, we say, well, this is who I am. A and it's expected that I'm going to sin. I can't really help how I think. Surely these little weaknesses I've got, they're not affecting anybody else. So surely they're not that bad. God would understand that I can't be expected to deal with everything in my life. And in any case, I haven't done anything particularly bad anyway. I'm not in prison, am I? So, as I said before, we, we, we try and rationalise these things. We, we reduce our sins almost to, a, if you like, a manageable level because we're good sin management managers. Remember that from yesterday? And, again, it's all it is. It's a fig leaf. A fig leaf mentality to make us not feel so ashamed or so naked. And we can see the exact same problem dis displayed in this care careless servant. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. What a statement. I will pay thee all. Me. You know what he's saying? I don't need forgiveness. I don't need you to forgive me because I am capable of paying this. You have patience. Wow. You have patience. That, that is incredible. There's a tendency here to, that we all have to underestimate the gravity of our sin, our standing before God. You know, if, if we were able to pay for sin somehow, then automatically there's no need for forgiveness because we're paying for it. Forgiveness is not accepting something by way of compensation from God. L let me give you, so for, or for God rather. We can't come to God and say, let me, I'm gonna, 
I want to put aside some very, very valuable things. Forgiveness is a complete and utter free pardon. God is, com is completely and utterly letting us off the hook. That's the definition of forgiveness. So, and our works then, as a result of that fact, our works come from appreciation, not compensation. Now, if you're anything like me, we do try to compensate God. We feel bad. We try and get our lives together. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and be more astute, and get to more meetings and more classes, make sure I get those leaflets out. And you actually put yourself under... God is saying, wrong attitude. I understand where you're coming from, but in actual fact, the attitude is, I appreciate so much what has been done. I'm going to make, a, I'm going to make an effort to get to the classes and, and do whatever I need to do to help brother and brothers and sisters because I want to, not because I have to. What a different motive that is, brothers and sisters. So what happens? Verse 27. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave the debt. That is much more than he asked. He asked just simply to be loosed. And he also asked to pay the debt back. Instead, he's loosed of the bond. Uh, here we are. Let's go forward. He's loosed of his bond completely. And you know that the, 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 this master could have actually said, you know what, I'll tell you what I'll do. And this would have been entirely fair. We would probably all agree. We would say to him, uh, look, I'll I tell you what. What about I'll loose you and... You've underestimated quite significantly the, the, the size of this debt. Look, I'll loose you for the purposes of going out and I'll be patient and you can go out and you can get what you can and just pay me back what you can. We would say, that's incredible compassion. That is amazing. We say, what a patient Lord this person was. But he didn't. He totally and freely forgave the whole lot. Not only is God loosing us from the debt, brothers and sisters, he's giving us the most wonderful gift, the most wonderful present that you could ever wish for and we struggle to appreciate it. It's a real tragedy, but we need to see this from God's perspective. Can you look at Psalm 103? Come over to Psalm 103. Let's, let's actually have a look and see what, how the psalmist puts what God has done for us. God has gone over and above. Psalm 103. We'll come in at verse 2. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all thine iniquities. Who heals all thy diseases. Who redeems thy life from destruction. Who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Yahweh is merciful and gracious and slow to... And all, now there's his character coming out. Slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. There is no measurement in terms of God's forgiveness. Don't even start measuring. There is no measurement. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. Why? Why is that so? Like as a father pitieth his children, so Yahweh pities them that fear him. What a God we have he remembers that we are dust he understands our predicament the mess we are in and consequently he has forgiven the debt a magnificent mind of compassion and mercy now for the purposes of, of our of our session this afternoon I don't want to take this parable much further because we're going to deal with it 
in our fourth session in regard to personal forgiveness. But suffice it to say this, that, a, in, that I'm sure you'll understand that a gauge, a true gauge of our appreciation of God's forgiveness to us would surely have to be, the true test would surely have to be then, is how our relationship and forgiveness is between each other. That's the acid test. Now, if you want the, tr the, the, the true measure of how grateful you are to God for his incredible mercy to you, brothers and sisters, how do you feel toward those who have wronged you? Because it happens. And it happens a lot in ecclesial life. It might not necessarily be ecclesial life that someone's wronged you. It's very, very challenging, brothers and sisters, a very challenging for, for, for many of us here. But I, I can't sugarcoat this any, any other way because that's God's challenge to us. Show me how much you appreciate what I have done for you by showing me, God, to your brother. That's how we do it. Manifest God to your brothers and sisters. And here again, I think we have a process. It may not be a frame of mind that miraculously occurs overnight. God's not suggesting that either. But God in his compassion, because of our weaknesses, in this area particularly, will continue to work with us and help us along that road with individual traumas and trials that come upon us. Remember that quote from 1 John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, if God has so forgiven us, we ought also to forgive one another. And there are no conditions attached. We can't say I'll forgive you on the condition that. It's a complete slate clean. And it should be a desire to do it as well saying to God that's the least I can do because I appreciate what you have done for me now unlike the the man that uh, the, the servant that owed 200 years wages there was another man that did appreciate what was done for him you, you turn to Luke 15 and verse uh, verse let's come in at verse 17 Luke 15, this is the prodigal son. 15 and verse, verse 17. We read this. And when he came to himself, so some background first, of course, it's probably a, a, good, a good thing to do. He's, he's, he's taken off from his father. He said, give me what's rightfully mine. Now, nothing's rightfully ours, but this is what he's demanded from his father. And off he goes. He lives a totally, totally un, uncontrolled and uncontained way of life. And there comes a time when the fun dries up. All his friends are gone. His cash is gone. And he's feeling pretty, pretty wretched and pretty empty. And he tries to take control himself. So see the pro his mind's going through this process, which is very, very similar to all of us. He tries, tries to take control by getting a good, well-paid job with the pigs. But along with his stomach, he becomes very, very empty. And he came to realise that life without God is not much life at all. It's vain, it's empty, and it's depressing. depressing. And he, he starts to look at himself. He takes a long, hard look at himself and says, What a fool. What a fool I've been. So verse 17, And when he came to himself, he said, just think about it. He says, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? Now, here's the first step. Confession. Verse 18. So he prepares a little speech. He's, he's rehearsing a speech that he's going to say to his, to his dad when he sees him again. He says, I will arise and go to my father and I will read confess unto him. Father... I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And here's repentance. And when he arose, he came to his father. But when he was yet... Now look at this. 
a great way off. His father saw him. He had compassion. He ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And brothers and sisters, there is only one way that his father could see him coming. A long way down the track. Only one way, and that is if he was looking out for him. He was looking. He wasn't in his lounge room, feet up with a book, thinking to himself, the boy knows. He knows where I am. He knows, he knows that he's got to come home and we're going to have a chat. He's out there looking for this boy. And the son said to him, Father, he says, now remember the speech that he prepared? He's got this rehearsed. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And his father doesn't even let him get to finish the rest of the little speech. And he says, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring in his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. What an occasion that was. Oh, there's the conversion. The son remained in the house. There we are. He was converted. He remained in the house after that. They continued to be in happy fellowship with each other. And I want to make, there we are, running to him, down the track. This is painting a picture of what our God is like. Do, do you relate to God like this? Two points from this parable. Just look at the stark differences, brothers and sisters, between two men that we've looked at. Look at the acknowledgement of sin. One man said, Give, have, have patience with me and I'll pay you back everything. And the other man says, I have sinned. Firstly and primarily, he says, I've sinned against heaven. Remember what David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Wow. What about his family? What about Uriah? What about all his, his wise men, the rest of the nation? I've sinned against heaven in the end. It's always against God. And when he stepped through God's righteous requirements, look at the response. He's greeted by a watching and waiting father. The forgiveness is overwhelming. Totally overwhelming. It's not just a, a bit of forgiveness which is sort of carefully portioned out for you. It's an abundance of forgiveness. The love of his father is far, far greater than what he was expecting. His father wouldn't hear him being a servant. He was quite prepared to, get, to live in the, ser the, the servants' quarters. That's a lot, lot a long way in front, brothers and sisters, of eating corn with pigs. And he's clothed and restored to sonship. There's almost, a, with the son here, there's almost this sense of bewilderment. And he's just swept along by this, by this beautiful man, the father. Just sweeps him up off his feet and just carries him and takes over and says, nah, forget, put a robe on him. And it's just, whoa, this is exciting. Put a robe on. Make it a nice one. The best robe. A ring on his finger, shoes on his feet. Get some food into him. Look at him. Skinny of a break of a man. Get some food in. A lot of it. My son is alive. My son, my son is alive. Brothers and sisters, we think that we're happy when we go to God in forgiveness and we pour our hearts out to him and we make a genuine attempt to do something about it. We think we're happy and relieved. And we can finally express to God our innermost thoughts and weaknesses and ask for forgiveness of these things. Well, the joy that we feel, brothers and sisters, is nothing. Obviously, it's nothing compared to how God feels when he sees true repentance. Whether a person is just baptised or they've been in the truth for 80 years, God's reaction is exactly the same. Look at verse 7 of, of chapter 15. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents 
more than the, the 99 just persons that need no repentance. And that person doesn't exist anyway. We all need repentance. What an incredible loving father we have. So, brothers and sisters, then, our need for forgiveness is complete and total. Without it, we cannot hope to be in God's kingdom. Without it, we cannot be made righteous. We are not justified by faith. And the way and the, uh, the, the process, the requirement that God has instituted are for our healing. God has even in his incredible mercy done that for us. He's done it for our benefit. He's done it for our good, brothers and sisters. In this process, God is trying to change our thinking process. He's putting new concepts, new ideas into our mind that we might become more and more sensitive, not only to the gravity of sin, but to the greatness of forgiveness. But also, we become very, very attuned to the wonder and the love that motivates God's forgiveness toward every single one of us.